Good evening. Once again, it's so good to be with you on this Wednesday after Easter Sunday. And I pray that we all will be able to maintain the spirit and the joy and the happiness and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior we have. As we begin, it's just right that we go to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that you have given us. And now as the evening gathers around us, we thank you for opportunity to reflect on what the day has been like, to see your fingerprints where we have been and to know that we have been loved. And now to be able to rest this evening and later on to close our eyes and sleep and know that we have a God who is always with us, who always cares. We pray that we might be found faithful to you and that we might be servants in ways of love that please you and cause you to rejoice that we are your children and together we are the family of God. Lord, we have friends and loved ones who are in trouble this evening in various ways, who just need the the knowledge that you're there and you love them and, and the grace that can only come from your loving care. We pray your hand will be upon each one and we're so thankful to know that no matter what the need may be, it may seem small and it may seem like a, a mighty mountain too big for us to climb, but whatever it is, your grace is sufficient and we trust you, Lord. We trust you you who raised Jesus from the dead and has given us, you have given us life, my, how we love you. And may we be found now in your service, in the joy of the Lord. That's where our strength is found. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to read a scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hand and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. God bless the reading of his word. I'd like to share a brief story that I wrote a few years ago. This is a true story, and uh, it's been on my mind a lot lately, and I know some of you have read this, and others, this may be your first time, but uh, I hope it will help us to understand the love and the grace of God. It isn't life when you live behind a dumpster. Abused and malnourished, he waited for the next drop of trash. Maybe there would be some food at this time. Life can be so cruel. Things started to change on the day that the farmer saw him. When he did, he went back to his house and returned with food and drink. When you've been down and kicked around in this world, you can lose your trust in people. For that reason, the farmer's kindness was refused. Disappointed but understanding, the farmer left the food and went home. When he did, the stranger feasted. This went on for about three days. And then something happened that had seemed impossible until this day. A friendship was formed between the two of them. In fact, he even moved into the farmer's house. This is a true story of kindness and mercy. I know because 
I was that farmer's pastor. I would visit with the two of them, and they were always so happy to be together. Isn't that the way that it should be in our friendship with Jesus? God understands the problems of broken and lonely lives. He also takes the first step to reach out to us with a refreshing supply of mercy and grace. God wants our friendship, not our religion. That farmer is now in heaven. And I remember the last time that I saw them together. They were riding on a four-wheeler across a hill behind the farmer's house. They were the truest of friends, the farmer and his dog. When I think about this, I think of a song that has meant a lot to me and I know to a lot of people since it had been written several years ago. And it asks the question, who am I? And it says, when I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace. On Mount Calvary, take my place. Then I ask myself the question, who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, but thine, Lord. The answer I may never know. How he ever loved me so. But to an old rugged cross he'd go. For who am I? In the Old Testament, there is a story. And it's a story about David. And David has had a friend named Jonathan who had been dead for quite a long time now. But when Jonathan was alive, David and Jonathan were the best of friends. They were so true and loyal to each other during some very difficult times. And now a lot of time has passed and David's thinking about Jonathan and he's king. And he's wondering, is there anyone at all left of Jonathan's family that I could show kindness to just because I loved Jonathan so. David had a man who helped him named Ziba, and he asked Ziba if he knew if there was anyone, and Ziba said, yes, there is, that Jonathan actually had a son who still was alive. But Ziba points out right away that he was crippled in both of his feet, and that he was hidden away. He, he was just living a, a life away from everyone else and just trying to stay out of people's way and just live to himself and stay out of trouble. But apparently he was also living a very poor life. And when David heard this, he said, well, that's the one that I want to show kindness to. I'd like to share some scriptures about what happened. First of all, you have David asking is one of Jonathan's family still alive? And he says, yes, he has a son with crippled feet. Where is he? The king asked. Now it's interesting because it seemed like Ziba was saying to David, you really won't gain anything from helping this man. He can't do anything for you. He can't be a soldier in your army. Uh, he's, he's going to be basically useless to you. And David seemed to just totally ignore all of that. And that's so wonderful and so important because that's what grace is about. And David paid no attention to that. He just wanted to know where he was. So David had him brought to him, and he was scared. He was frightened. It was a troubling thing to come into the presence of a king. And David said words that we expect to hear our Lord say, Don't be afraid. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. And then he went on to say, 
I will give you everything that you've ever lost, and I will have you sit and eat at the king's table. Now, this man's name was Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth bowed respectfully, and he exclaimed to David, Who is your servant that you should show kindness to a dead dog like me? That's how he saw himself as a dead dog. And why in the world would someone pay any attention to him and show him kindness? He just couldn't understand that. The important thing is that David did this out of grace because of Jonathan. He loved Jonathan so. And the story ends saying this, And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly with David. Now that's a beautiful story of grace, and it's a great reminder to us of just how much God loves us. You can imagine God saying, I want to show kindness to others because of my son, Jesus. And hasn't he been gracious to us? Not because we deserve it. There's none of us that can say, I deserve God's love. God should pay attention to me because I've been so faithful to him. There's no one that can say that. No one. We may do the best that we can possibly do. But the reason we receive the attention of God, the love of God, the promises of God, is because Jesus loved us enough to die on a cross for us. He loved us enough to shed his own blood for us, and he's able to say to the Father in heaven as he intercedes for us, Father, I have loved them, and I have loved them all the way. And because we are loved by Jesus, the Father offers us such grace. And that's a wonderful, wonderful truth that we all can enjoy because if some of us uh, thought we had to earn our salvation, we'd just feel hopeless, wouldn't we? We would just feel totally left out of it all. But we don't have to feel that way because we have the grace of God. We might be like Mephibosheth who wants to know from God, who am I that you would love someone like me? And yet you do. And we remember that story that I started to read as we began with Jesus in the upper room, meeting the disciples there. Remember how they were in that upper room on the day of resurrection. Jesus is alive, but they were just having trouble understanding all of this and putting it together in their lives. And they were afraid that the Sabbath was over and the Jewish leaders would be after them. And they were huddled in a corner in an upper room because they were afraid. Well, that will never do with Jesus. And Jesus came to them, appeared to them suddenly. And he came to get them out of that upper room. He came to show them that now because of the resurrection, they could live. In fact, John, who wrote the story, told us that Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. We don't have to live locked up in an upper room anymore. We don't have to live behind some kind of spiritual dumpster, living off the scraps of religion. We can have a living, joyful friendship, relationship with God himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. A real, living, powerful relationship. Jesus came into the room where they were so afraid. He showed them his hands and his side. And suddenly these people who were so afraid, now the Bible says that they were overwhelmed with joy. That's what God wants to do for you and for me. That's his promise to us. He breathed on them and 
said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he sent them out of that upper room so that they would live something different than a mundane life of faith, but that they might live faith to its fullest. They might experience what it is to spread your wings as though you were flying with an eagle, to run and not grow weary, to live life to its fullest, and to feast on the goodness of God. As we begin this new year following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'd like to encourage you, and I want to do the same myself, to grasp hold of this wonderful truth of the resurrection power of Christ. We no longer have to live in fear and bound down. We are able to be free. The truth sets us free and we can be free indeed to live and serve and let this world know that there is a better way. And the better way is to serve our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray God's richest blessings on you this evening and always. Hallelujah. Amen.